Who are we missing? Do we? Have, I know. I'm sorry. Hey, Tracy. Here's, hey. I'm wondering if someone else can go first and I can go second, just so I can yeah. have an idea of how these conversations have been going since I wasn't uh, free yesterday. I'll tell you how I'll tell you how it went yesterday. Um, I'll explain in the beginning that I contacted um, both the Missouri and the Tribune um, because we, as Race Matters, were feeling like the reporting was not capturing the voices of people who are, um, you know, uh, minoritized and marginalized in our community. So when we watched the school district coverage, we we power players get rid but not the people and so we were concerned about that and ruby and i've had several interactions and so she understands um, that more deeply so i thought it would be important for her to get to meet some of the other people that we work um, with to get their uh, feedback and interest she also knows about our meeting with the city consultants and how that went and so she's interested in having a deeper understanding of um, what, what our concerns are and um, also to pass that on to her students and their editors and advisors so that they can do a better job. So um, that's, that's really it. So um, I thought what you said um, was very powerful at the meeting we had last week. And that's why I included it in the email because I think that is the probably the most crucial issue that we keep facing every time we do something with the city, but it shows up in other ways, like in reporting. So our conversation with the Tribune went very well. What he said to us was, you know, newspapers are on the lifeline and I can't, you know, do the kind of coverage that we want. He gave it, told us that the paper is going in a new direction. Um, he shared with us an editorial that he wrote that he um, discovered recently that his ancestors owned slaves and, and so he's had a very different perspective. He considers himself um, pro Black Lives Matter and um, very concerned about having a more diverse um, newspaper group. They have 11 papers and they only have one black reporter that he just hired last week um, for the Tribune, who is their sports writer. So um, now that guy's going to cover city politics and local government, which scares me because he's young and I'm worried about the pushback and resistance he'll get. And I'm also worried about what kind of support he will get as a young, as a young black journalist. So we had a very frank discussion. Um, Angela was here yesterday, all had an opportunity to talk and they really kind of much discussed all those issues. The only person that wasn't at the meeting yesterday was Lynn and Angela and Chad and the rest of us sort of filled in on that community policing um, conversation, but Lynn's he I'm here today. So anyway, does that make sense? It does to me, but I was at the meeting, so. Okay, I know I'm, I'm talking to Brittany. Does that make sense, Brittany? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So I just figured it would be easier if we let you talk about what your concerns are in terms of the media and the issues that you see um, locally from the perspective of yourself and faith, faith, voice, faith voices, sorry. Yeah, um, and I'll be pretty brief as well because I don't think I have too much to add outside of uh, concerns that I flagged last week. Uh, nice to meet you, Ruby. My name is Brittany Hughes. I'm the organizer here in Columbia for Missouri Faith Voices. Um, and yeah, I think, I think my rhetoric is pretty much the same. Uh, diversity and equity and inclusion aren't enough. Those are very front facing things. And I think ultimately what we need to be talking about is anti-racism and how are we doing that work and how is that work reflected um, in all of our systems and all of our spaces. Um, and that would include media as well. Um, what is the reporting that gives dignity and worth and value to people outside of their tragedies or their worst moments? Um, who are the people that we're lifting up in stories? Who are the faces that we see when we read um, articles? Who are the people covering these issues, much like Tracy talked about? Um, I know for us, we've been doing a lot of work around housing. Uh, here in the city, um, we're trying to raise funds for a 24-7, uh, 365 shelter for unhoused folks here in the city um, in the talks to actually get some 
government funds for that and working with some organizations to um, essentially have hand over the project, which is really exciting. Um, but we've had a really, really tough time in the two years that we've been pushing on this, actually getting response from media to cover the things that we've been doing, whether that be op-eds that we're writing, uh, whether it be uh, public meetings that we're having that we're asking people to turn out to um, and dialogue with folks who will be directly impacted by those issues. Um, very similar with policing. We do a lot of work right now uh, around uh, county policing, particularly the sheriff's office, because the sheriff's office currently corroborates with ICE, which means folks are getting deported from uh, our county. Um, a lot of times these are people who uh, should be let go for whatever it was that they were picked up for. Uh, we know that there are folks who had charges outright dropped, who were still put on an ice hold, uh, which means that ICE came to pick them up. Um, and those people were either uh, put into deportation proceedings or they um, are currently at um, in a uh, detention center outside of KC. Um, there's a young man, um, Willie Garcia, William Garcia, that we've been working with who actually sued the county or sued uh, Centralia because of uh, an unwarranted arrest. And now he's in deportation proceedings. Um, and so these are all things that we know about that we really want the public to be aware of. But part of that link in making sure that there's public education um, is having uh, relationships with media and trust with media that they're actually gonna take the stories and not uh, further traumatize or impact folks, uh, but put people in a position to get their stories heard uh, so that folks can, one, hear those stories, but two, so that there's a greater opportunity to organize and mobilize folks around the things that are happening to the people in our county uh, and in our city. Um, and I think that might be all, all I have, Tracy. You're on mute. By the way, Brittany, um, Ruby and I had a conversation about that very thing about building um, relationships and trust um, in terms of public education, because I've brought a couple of issues to her attention. And so she got to see firsthand um, the ways that her cub journalists didn't know how to navigate situations. So I think she'll talk about it. She designed a class um, this semester specifically designed to help her students think, think more deeply shows up um, in um, their reporting. So it's just the first semester. Um, I'm sure it'll be an ongoing project, but it's something that wasn't there before. And it's hard for us as activists to, you know, um, plant that. So um, I think that um, she's trying to get, get, them, get them there. Um, but I'm glad you came because I, I think these are very important issues to us as well. And I really appreciate the work you guys are doing. I'm I love student journalists. Um, try to make myself as available for them as I can. We've had many faith in life kids uh, reach out for stories for their classes and such. Um, and part of the reason that I make myself accessible in that way is because I know that they're going to have a job that's not class related someday. Mm. Um, and whether they stay here in Columbia, or whether they move on elsewhere, um, just wanting to keep those relationships um, as, as friendly um, and as open as possible. Thank you for that. I know that can't always be easy. Um, and I thank you all. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I think next, our next team is Laura and um, Angela and Iman, who are going to talk about issues related to Columbia Public Schools. And they each have a piece of that. I think that Sterling may or may not have something to say about school but you know and also I want to encourage everyone to use chat and to make comments because sometimes we can't get to everything so feel free to put something in the chat and put it in the parking lot um, we may not get to it in this conversation but it'll be in the chat in the parking lot and we can come back to it for another discussion and um, certainly now that you know Ruby that you can email her and pick up individual conversations um, on your own um, so Laura and Angela and Iman, and on Thursday because you weren't with us yesterday. So go ahead and introduce yourself, and then you and Laura um, can tag team on your conversation with Iman. Okay. 
Hi, Ruby. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm Angela Jasper. Um, I am also a member of Faith Voices, and I'm also a member of um, the ECPAC, which are our equity parent and um, action collaboratives that we are trying to get started here um, in Columbia. Uh, we want to focus citywide on what we can do to help with equity issues, but right now a lot of our time is being pulled to the school system. Um, lots of reasons, right? Uh, and so that's where we're doing a lot of our work right now. Um, Laura, do you want to, how do you want to talk about this? Hi, Iman, how are you? Hi, Angela. Hi, Iman. Hey. Hi, Ruby. Hi, Laura. Ruby, I met you last year at a Race Matters Friends um, fundraising event at Top 10 Wines. Oh, yeah. It's been a long time. It seems like that was a long time ago, but it was just about a year ago. That was five years <laughs> back ago. Back when we could years. like sit together and drink wine. Mm -hmm. oh, remember those days? Long time ago, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think my first big concern was with the school board meeting on Monday night. Of course, we have all this attention, you know, on the school reopen thing, right? Right. Which, of course... We know that that's going to get coverage and attention, et cetera. But also what happened that night, which, you know, didn't get any real good coverage at all, was this equity statement that, you know, the board voted to pass. And it has a lot of issues around it that I would hope um, somebody would have would have picked up and seen and and really delved into to work with. Um, it was also brought up at last month's board meeting and, and there wasn't coverage of it either, mm -hmm. of course, because of the obsession with, you know, the what's going to happen with school kind of thing. Um, and so I think that was, that's like a huge concern because we know there's been so many equity issues and problems in the school and um, very much related to what Brittany was saying. Um, you know, the school district this equity policy does not have an anti-racism focus in it. And we brought that up to them and they don't want to have anything to do with that in there. Um, and so that's, that was a little, that's something that I have, I'm struggling with. Can I add to that, Laura, really quickly? Yeah. Um, well, and I think I'm just going to, this is my opinion, but I do think that we've had, that's some strategy that's happening. I think that we are um, working to try to pass quickly this equity stuff while COVID is happening. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't have to do that. There's a recording policy that has been worked on for much longer and could have been put up for the school board to talk about um, at this last meeting, but I do think they're trying to squeak this through right now. Um, that was pretty evident for me when they decided not to revisit it again for two years. Um, they just kind of, it feels like a checkbox. Um, and so there were no action statements. There were no anti-racism. And these were all feedback that we had already given them. This was our second read. So we, they read it last time. We gave them feedback. We emailed them feedback and absolutely none of those changes were made. Um, and so it, it seems that it's a checkbox that we're making. And so I guess one of my ask for media coverage is that um, kind of trying to be observant of those little things that the little things that are happening here and there um, that I feel like are trying to get swept under the rug. Another example is um, the fact that we have asked for Zoom to continue through all of our school board meetings during the summer. We were able to do our school board meetings through Zoom and it was so much more accessible to people we had such a huge turnout. I felt like they went super smoothly um, and we were able to hear view viewpoints from everybody. It was, it was equitable, look at that. Um, and then so since we've been able to move back sort of to the school board meetings, they have stopped the Zooms mm -hmm. and we have asked over and over and over for them to resume. Um, and it's interesting to me because all of their meetings right now, IEP meetings, they're all being handled through Zoom, right? This is the only meeting that we are doing, um, that, that, the public meeting, through a 60-person audience. And um, there, there's a, a two-hour wait line at this last one. Um, a lot of our parents have kids that they need to supervise and want to call in from home, but you're literally silencing a whole 
group of people by not adding Zoom. And I think that's something that the media should really, really help us push. Again, we don't have the power. Um, and I think media could be a really big asset in that. Another example is pushing public comment to the very end of the meeting. Um, I mean, we just have lots of different ways that they seem to be silencing um, any, any voices that are asking for any amount of change at this point. Um, and so I think that that's where I see media being helpful in just highlighting and, and making other people aware that these are things that we're asking for. So maybe it's not just us asking for the Zooms, right? Maybe somebody on, I'm going to say this, I hope I don't offend anybody, the right side of town says, well, that's a really good idea too. Like we should be fighting for that. I mean, we saw how many people stood up and said, let our kids back in school, right? And so my hope is that if we can get the word out that I don't know, kids are being locked in boxes, all of these things, our whole community can come together and stand up for what's right. Um, but we, we, like Brittany said, we just don't have the power because we're not in those positions. And so I'm hoping that media would be a tool for us in that way. Right, and the voice suppression issue is really huge. And, you know, if reporters were there, they saw that the kid, like on the Monday night, kids were locked out of the board meeting that wanted to speak. Um, there was even a situation where like the parent was person number 50 and their child was number 51 and parent, you know, number 50 comes in and then the security people locked the doors and separated the mom from the child and just were very difficult about that. Then the mom had to leave out and then the next person in line came in and there were people holding seats in there. So when public comment time came, there was no one from CPS working in the door. There were no board members saying, can somebody go out there and see if there's anybody who wants to speak on the agenda items that allow for public comment? Nobody went out there to see. We, the public, were having to text and work the room to see, you know, did anybody else want to speak? And I mean, I'm someone that believes in that. We got to have voices. And whether you agree with me or not, I feel like your voice should be heard. I and mean, there were people out there that were speaking maybe on, on different than I believe, and they were locked out. And I was trying to get other, and our people were leaving out, our group were leaving out so that everybody could come in. But then there were people that are, work for the school district that were sitting there holding like five chairs and they never went up for public comment. Yes, they have the right to be in there and watch. But in my opinion, they were like holding chairs so that people couldn't come in and nobody was facilitating from CPS the process to allow people to come in. That to me was a huge story happening right before reporters' eyes and you heard nothing about it. And so um, if I might, um, hello um, everyone. Hello Ruby, it's such a pleasure to, um, to meet you. I believe we've met at a Race Matters Friends meeting. Well, we didn't meet, but I had the pleasure of seeing you um, briefly um, at a meeting. Um, as well. And I wanted to um, just kind of um, move off of that to say that um, it's clear that there's a disconnect between what CPS um, says is important to them, even this latest equity statement. Um, it's not anti-racist. Um, and even within the flowery, nice looking words, um, there's a gigantic disconnect between what's actually happening on the ground. Um, you're going to hear some of those um, stories you just heard from Angela and, and Laura. Um, and it's uh, one of the ways that you can see this also is with some of the families. So I grew up in Columbia, and um, but I've been blessed to be connected to lots of different um, communities, um, uh, people of different backgrounds, religions, et cetera. And so um, some of those are the refugee and immigrant communities. And um, I am struggling with, with understanding how CPS is missing some really important pieces. Um, for example, um, when the entire, we know that the pandemic is a new situation. No one, you know, could predict it. No one, you know, it's, it's everything is new, but there should have been some um, things in place to where CPS is not reinventing the wheel. Like um, a lot of the families were um, whose primary language is not English were not able to access information in a language that they could understand. 
and we're talking about you know even like the main webinars that they had um, were not in languages that um, that a significant portion of the students families um, would be able to understand on one of the webinars i attended um one of the translators was saying like where are the parents on here and she was like they're not on here because they never got the email and um some of them don't have internet like how are we missing these like really it seems to be like very obvious things and it's not like cps this is their first year of business you know so how is it that you know um there's not better protocols in place how is it that we brought to them for example the idea of using like that Zoom has like translation um, possibilities and transcription possibilities. Like, I it's confusing as to you know how you know this is new information. And and I have to say I, I had extensive conversations, for example, with Shelly Fair, and it's and she seemed you know genuinely to want to help families and kids. But how is it that um, that these things weren't already in place? You know, and and um, the translator on the one webinar was like, you know, even for families who got who had internet and got the emails. Um, often it was like in English, you know, in a language that they couldn't understand. And this entire process has been so difficult for so many people who, especially like even folks who have privilege, even folks who speak, you know, English fluently are, are having difficulty. I really just can't imagine what it's like for folks who, who can't. And, and I think we're going to lose a large group of kids this year, like in terms of their academic performance, we already know like Fs have increased significantly. Um, so what's going on? It's like, it feels almost like they don't care too much about, you know, these kids, because if the kids who are in these um, privileged positions are also, some of them are falling through the cracks, then um, we have to know that the folks who are marginalized are, are way below that most likely. Um, so, um, so just, yeah, I just wanted to speak to the fact that there's a disconnect between what CPS says and then what happens on the ground. And I think that folks are, there's just, there's no excuse. I, I just, mm -hmm. I, I get it that it, it's not gonna be perfect, but there's just no excuse for the way it's been handled so far. There's just none. I think one thing about COVID is it's, it's just, it is revealing the lack of equity, it's revealing what's always been in place or the lack thereof, what's always been in place. And in my head, that's a story all on its own. Like, what are we learning about our school district? I feel like it's being run as the school district of 500 people. It's not, it's a huge school district. And so your infrastructure and your technology and your level of professionalism, it needs to, the bar is high, right? And we're seeing now that we are inadequate. We are not being transparent. We are not thinking about all kids equally. We are not doing those things. And COVID has really revealed all of that. And my, my biggest fear is that when we ever get back to normal, everybody forgets all that stuff. And the kids and the families that were suffering before because of inequity will continue to suffer because of inequity. Because now the people that have for the first time in their lives are back in their franchise and privileged positions and nobody cares. So um, I just really, I used to work for the, um, Ruby, I used to work for the school. And so from the inside out, I, I have known that this infrastructure is not there, that um, our values are actually not the values of CPS. And it's, it's sad and it's heartbreaking, but I feel like unless they are put in a position constantly by a majority of people to raise the bar, um, it's not gonna happen because change is hard, right? Change is hard work and they've been doing this for a very long time and um, it's going to take a lot of hard work to change, but it's so necessary. And I'll just add on to what Iman was saying about the um, English learner students. Um, they were just like this afterthought um, at the board meeting on Monday night and they weren't even included in these votes that were so screwed up and weird anyways, but they just basically never had them on the official vote. Like when you went to look at the agenda ahead of time, they had left them completely off of um, them as a group to work on things, left them off. And then they realized that I think, um, 
I don't know if it was because of an email that was sent or a text that I sent to a board member that I was upset that they had left them off in the reading of the vote or what, I, you know. Um, but they uh, then somehow Dr. Siepelman tells them that, that he wants that amended on to the vote. So they amended it on in the meeting, like just then like, oh, afterthought, let's put them on. So it's that whole afterthought, afterthought, you know, stuff. And I went back and listened to, to the board meeting again, Iman, and yeah, it's there. So, I, and I transcribed a lot of that today. Um, so that That's I can make sure I had, yeah, so that I can make sure that I was correct in that memory, um, mm. that, it, that it did had to be and double checking the agenda and everything. But yeah, I have, I have that clip and I have the um, transcription of that happening. So that, you know, definitely is, it, is there that, that kind of afterthought, I guess, is the best way to, it was just very symbolic when you, when you see them adding it on, you know, to a mm -hmm. vote like that. Oh, right. and by the way, let's not forget about um, that. Right. Which and is I upsetting also, because, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Well, it's upsetting because, you know, it's been brought to their attention and it's been brought to their attention when in the pandemic particularly and yeah. the, the extra importance of, um, of dealing with that. So I, I'm, it's very disappointing. Thank you so much for speaking up. I am, I'm, I'm flabbergasted. Mm -hmm. I want, I want to add to Laura's comment, two things. One is if they use Zoom, uh, Laura would not have had to spend a chunk of her day today um, transcribing because um, there's no reason for them to have a, a, a not to have a pro um, access. Zoom for a lot of people also translated into other languages. And the other thing that really just set me off Monday was putting the reopening um, at the end of the council meeting and calling it new business when it is not new business, it is old business to make everyone wait until as late as possible when they have kids and stuff like that. And I was telling Ruby that I thought it was retaliation and revenge. I mean, that's, I, I see the school district very much like the city, if they don't get their way, they will find ways to punish you with the process, which is we'll make you, we, we won't let you speak until 10 o'clock. We know you all want to talk about this, about this one particular issue. So we'll put it as late as we can on the agenda. And we'll spend a good chunk of the meeting in the beginning saying how wonderful Peter Steepleman is. Total rot. So, um, those are the kind, Somebody, of, tricks. Those are the kind of tricks that get missed a lot in reporting that they do that kind of stuff. Somebody, and I'm sure it's in an email somewhere, but someone I actually know. said that the reason that they moved the comments to the end was because everybody was using public comment as a media frenzy, like yes. trying to start media. Someone That's, said but, that, a board yeah, member Chris Horn, said but that. You can't, Chris you, Horn said that. Yeah, but you can't change that, it. You know. You cannot change public. You cannot that. change public comment at a summer retreat without notice, notifying the public and putting it on the agenda. You can't do it in closed session without notifying the public either. If if they made a decision, they have to come out and report that they did that. And that's some crazy nonsense that the public is like trying to you know, we only get one time to speak in the whole meeting and they get to speak the whole time, and suddenly it's about oh you guys are just coming there to try to promote your agenda. That's crazy, but they did yeah. it in the dark. That's my problem. Unless somebody can find me documentation that they posted notice that they're going to change public comment. I don't Yeah. They did it behind everyone's back. Again, I've, rec I've retaliation that. people were asking any questions. I've and I think it's- I've requested the vote. I've requested that from Tracy Davenport that I wanna see the vote. And I, I mean, I just requested it Monday and I haven't heard back but um I think it's important that we say that it's Chris Horn too because my, yeah, in my he, conversations he um with Chris and with Dave they have fought for things that would make things more equitable I know that they were trying to champion zoom happening again and instead of kind of looking to them as experts in equity our African-American board members they're silenced outvoted they're the newbies they're not what we want um, and so it almost feels like, I don't know, when they got elected, I think that some of us were pretty hopeful um, that maybe some change would start to happen and we would at least have some different viewpoints. But so far, the things that they've tried to push for, as simple as Zoom meetings continuing, 
have been ex nade like so it doesn't feel like they their voice equals other people's voices on the board um and so and that's that's upsetting we're talking about equity we're talking about an equity policy and it's and, and ruby i think that what angela is saying is a huge um thing that a reporter could look at and it's something that they could even do retroactively um, they don't have to be at a board meeting. What they can do is pull up these video clips of the past board meetings since David and Chris have been elected. And I was noticing it today when I was transcribing this and, and listening to the meeting again, is how few turns they get to take of their voice not being heard. The microaggressions that are happening towards them, the way Dr. Steepleman does not make eye contact when they speak. I mean, it's it's so apparent or it's very the clear fact, the fact that, um, you know, there was we go back. Let's go back to the summer board retreat that about about eight of us went there because, again, it was very restricted seating and they were doing the equity training at that meeting. We wanted to see what it looked like because um, it's this hidden process. Doc, Dr. Steepleman didn't told the. Um, MU journalism students that they could not come to the board meeting until after the equity training, then they could show up. Even though they were allowed to be there before then, even though they could have come in when we came in, he, he told them they couldn't come in until after. And Angela and I saw that, that he was texting them, texting them about, you know, content and what they could report, et cetera. And so that whole, I don't know what's going on there but there not, might need to be a conversation with your students about, you know, when a person in power is trying to censor what's going on, how do you handle that? Um, I, I know you discussed that, but I mean, it's really, it was Laura, really disturbing. Will you tell um, Ruby what happened on Monday night at the um, board meeting with the students and what Peter was telling them that they could write about and not write yeah. about? Yeah, so um, at this at the meeting Monday night, um, which was very difficult, which is another back to the zoom, just a little side thing is when people were trying to watch it live. Um, the audio is so bad that no one can really understand what's going on. So that's another issue. Fortunately, the recording you guys, the audio is very clean and clear. Okay, so um, Anyways, one of the issues brought up were these, um, they just had done grades, these interim progress reports, they call them IPRs. Mm -hmm. So it's where the kids all find out, you know, about four to six weeks into school, like what their grades are in all their classes. So I, um, the person who tracks that, Dr. Wilson, was up reporting that information and that data to the board. They had, they had all that data on Thursday and they never gave it to the board. So that's, that's a story right there. Why were they withholding that? when they knew the board had this critical vote and that could have been data that the board needed to make a vote. Instead, they dropped the bomb right up there only because they made them come up and they tried to, to mow over it and go past it. But luckily, Blake Willoughby reminded them, you need to bring that IPR info up. Finally go up there and it's like 600% increase in failing grades in, in the non-core classes, like all the electives and in middle school and like a 400% increase in high school and then other significant increases in the core. All that's reported. And now it was prefaced with, oh, there were some, there might've been some technical glitches. We don't know, you know, all this like long preamble of excuses. So when, a couple of the reporters were packing up at the end and kind of getting ready to go out. And even Roger McKinney, who was there for the Tribune, Dr. Siepelman was talking to them and just saying things like and texting people, um, you know, please, please don't report anything about that until we have the exact numbers and that we get this data to checked for glitches and things like that. You know, so already I'm thinking he's trying to control the narrative. He's trying to, um, you know, suppress the data to get out there. Mm -hmm. It's just concerning. Understood. Yeah. 
I'm taking notes and I'm listening. Thank and you I, so much. Of course, I just want to know. I know, I know you are. I mean, I just appreciate you listening, and I, I don't want it to sound like all of my all of my comments come from a concern about how I view Dr. Steepleman trying to suppress and intimidate reporters, and I and it's really um, a concern to me. Hey, I'd like to um, interject at this point. I know um, initially we set the meeting up for a two-hour session. I also want to make sure what your availability is, so we have time to um, yeah, it was, share the bandwidth. off the call at four. Okay. So I can do an hour now. I've got a couple of things I have to do. I'm more than willing to come back on. Mm -hmm. um, I can come on tonight when I get home. <laughs> but I'll come back on the night <laughs> um, okay. or any other point. Um, but yeah, I've got a, I got a meeting. I have to be at it at four. Okay. Uh, we have, we have, are we getting about like three thirty? is okay. We have race. Meeting. You have what? I'm sorry. Is, is, so basically if we like go until about like a quarter till or three thirty, is that like cutting too close yeah. to your next meeting? That's quarter good. Till would be perfect. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, I want to pivot to um, Lynn and um, and then um, Sterling and Kendra and Maria. I think um, Lynn's going to talk about um, police and the CPRB. I think Sterling uh, may want to chime in on that. And Kendra um, probably is going to want to chime in on that. And Maria, I think you probably want to chime in on that from a couple of places, not Okay. Uh, so and utilities um, in terms of transparency. Okay. Uh, so I know Ruby, when you came to Columbia, when we were when I was still on the executive committee, we had a meeting with you, and I don't know that I have much more to say. I, I told you about a number of my concerns speaking with student journalists at the time, because I'm not on the executive committee anymore, Tracy. Really, I don't get contacted much by student journalists, but. You know, I could just repeat, I know what um, what concern is that students would clearly not have read the documents that go to meeting and then they'd report on the presentation and not realize that the oral presentations can be very, very different, even apparently contradictory to the written substance of a report, right? Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that we would see often, like both at CPS meetings and at work sessions or city council meetings where students having to leave before the end of the meetings when sometimes very critical issues would come up. And, you know, I'm sympathetic to having a big class load, but sometimes something really important would come up right after they would leave, you mm -hmm. know. Um, I think that the, it's a, would seem often like the coverage was really just about what would be said off the, from the dais, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, as Tracy makes very explicit on the Facebook page, quite often there's so much going on between who's even being requested to do the work. We have RFPs aren't going out, uh, work is being planned without the community being involved in the process. You already know all of this stuff. So I don't know that I really need to take up much of your time. These are just, you know, kind of ongoing issues, I think, for student journalists. Um, so I think I'll just, you know, give the time to somebody else who has something to say you haven't already heard me say <laughs> so are you sure because i still want to hear what you have to say and i do recall our conversation but if there if those things are in they and i'm sure they are still an issue certainly just because you said them once two years ago doesn't mean you cannot repeat each and every one of them right now that you find to still be important you are really it's worth my time and i'd appreciate it okay um what I've learned through Race Matters Friends is how much, how important the story is beyond the documents. And when students would call me, quite often they would want, it sounded like a sign, sound bite. They almost wanted something a little bit that was oppositional. They wanted me to say something provocative about the police. And then I would respond by giving them, this is the report we're looking at, and this is why what we want, and this is why we care about this being an important document. And that wouldn't get written about, and they wouldn't ask me more questions about it. You know, I'd be disappointed by how few questions they would ask when they would ask me about what I was going to speak about at council or why I cared about a particular document. So encouraging them to have more questions about who requested this document be written, what was the purpose of that, 
how does this document fail or succeed in meeting that purpose? You know, the, the context mm -hmm. uh, was continually being missed in the conversations that I would have with students. And I got that as a much larger project and, you know, that may be beyond what they have the capacity to do while they're in school, but it just seems so important. You know, the, what would happen in the meeting was such a small image. You, well, you know, and again, this may be an impossible thing to expect students to be able to pick up on, but when uh, CPD submitted the report by Robert Fox about community policing, the city council was dead silent. They said nothing for or against it. I think they're kind of basically congratulatory as they are. Six months later, the mayor said, oh, that report was dead on arrival. But he said not a peep when the report was submitted and when we were going to the pulpit, or the pulpit, the, <laughs> the microphone to speak. It does feel like a pulpit, right? Um, so there are these very large silences that are not asked about you know when something that the, the public's been waiting for we've had a lot of discussion for and then the city council says nothing but just kind of very bland congratulatory statements you know you can find out six months later that actually a lot's going on and nobody's asking them because you, you wouldn't know if you didn't know the background you wouldn't know that it was a conspicuous silence so i don't know how you train kids who haven't been there very long to notice those but they're really, they're so frustrating for us as activists, right? Because nobody asks those questions. Well, the other trick is that they put things on the work session agenda. So for example, um, the latest community policing update report came to a work session, which is before the council meeting. And I'm not allowed to speak. And so if you look at the document, and then you hear what they say. I mean, Lynn went to the meeting and the, the council kind of grumbled about it, but they got up there and like, wow, we did this great job. And if you look at the report, you're like, I think there are some kindergartners that can do a better job, you know? So um, there's just no like critical reflection on even their work production about what they say that they're doing. So if, if there's supposed to be a plan, like Lynn said, like, so where's the plan? <laughs> like, what are you supposed to be doing? And, um, we can't get anywhere. Lynn wasn't in on this conversation, but the, I think everybody else was except for maybe Brittany and Angela. We learned something or, that we heard from uh, Mr. Von Nostrum yesterday at the Tribune. And he said, I've, you know, I've worked in a lot of cities, big cities. This is the only city I've worked in where every you know, chief of the superintendent has a flack that keeps the media from being able to talk to them. He goes, they have a PR person or a PIO that gets in front so you can't get information. They, he goes, we can't get Brian uh, Treese on the record for an interview. Um, he said that uh, Peter Stiepelman refused to, to speak to his reporters and that, but Peter Stiepelman called and complained about the reporter. And he's like, have you ever had a sit down conversation with this reporter? And Stiepelman said, no, and he got, then he said, well, I'm done with you. So, I mean, we have a real problem in trying to not only get information, but get people who have power, who, who are, you know, need to be accountable up to us um, to actually um, speak. And I think, uh, I think that Maria has some more to add to that and certainly um, Sterling, but Lynn, did you have anything else? No, those, those are kind of the repeated That's experiences lot, like right? we have with students. Um, work know? sessions. Yeah, really getting more of the context for why the document's being written and why it fails or succeeds is really uh, frustratingly missing from <laughs> the way that they get reported on. So yeah, that's my basic concern about the policing coverage. So Maria, you wanna talk about um, transparency there and kind of uh, tag team with Lynn? I've had uh, uh, good experiences with um, the classroom journalism cla students, uh, when they're doing their projects at the end of the year, for some reason, uh, over the past few years, I've been able to capture somebody's imagination. So they come and they do interviews and they do, you know, recordings and, and this is not for the press. It is not for publication. Um, I, I've been impressed. I, I have. Uh, I went to Boston University School of Public Communication. So I understand the 
rigorous work that has to go in informing these young minds because you're not telling them this is how you write. You're telling them this is how you look at the world and this is how you communicate it. So I have a lot of respect for the school and what you do there. Um, I'm involved on a, a couple of different levels uh, with Race Matters Friends, with school, but mostly I represent Transparency Matters. Where are the people who pushed for the performance audit? Um, so I can go into specifics and examples like everyone else did, but I wrote down three key things. One is the understanding of the word transparency. People seem to think that it means everything gets discussed openly everywhere. That's not transparency. Transparency is understanding how decisions got made. We don't have to be uh, doing FOIA requests for simple answers to simple, straightforward questions. That's not being transparent. Um, that's to, so that's one thing. And it would be good if the students understood mm -hmm. that difference, that it's what is being asked for is a legitimate form of how we do governance. governance. Um, I, I'm sorry, I can't even read my own handwriting at this point. Um, I did have a question. A lot of our conversations, both on Race Matters Friends and under um, uh, what's going on with the school district, I too am a parent of a, a middle schooler, there's a lot of information that is coming out of these discussions on Facebook. Are the students encouraged or is the Missourian encouraging their reporters to look at this? Because they're getting specific information, including specific people's names and contacts. Um, that was, that was uh, nice. Maria, I want, Maria, I want to answer that really quickly. Yeah. Um, I um, actually forbid students to do that on our Facebook page. If it would be one thing if they got on there and read, yeah. but they actually email and say, will you give me a contact? And it's never worked out because I've tested it to see if they've done their homework or whatever. So they get on there. And, and the last thing I want is people reporting what they see on Facebook because there is a lot of hearsay. And, and actually, you know, making contacts with people and building relationships is what they should be doing so that they can do adequate reporting. So, and I tell them that I'm, we're very open about it, okay. um, but, you know, it still happens that they're like, um, can someone answer, you know, and I don't want them to do that because that's cheating. That's not real journalism. So. And, and the reason I ask that is because um, many of uh, my, my neighborhood parents were shocked to find out that teachers were never involved in the decision-making process. And this came as, as a shock because um, one of my neighbors is a labor union person who said, how are you, how are you making decisions about these people's work life mm -hmm. and not including them in the discussions? They, so it was those kinds of conversations that were really shocking. So that was just an aside. Um, I finally read my notes. The other thing I wanted to say about transparency is an element of transparency is acknowledgement. If someone has made a mistake, if there is a procedural problem, mm -hmm. they need to acknowledge it. I do not expect your journalists to know that when there has been a problem, when there has, when the accountability isn't there, when a mistake has been made and no one acknowledges that mistake or that error. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say that whenever I talk to someone and they approach me after a city council meeting, I always say that line, that's transparency. And that's, that's a, a real, it's not fun. It's not exciting. People want to see fireworks. It's not going to happen that way. It's going to happen when someone on city council or on a board of commission says, you know what? This was wrong and we did it and we're sorry and this is what we're going to do to fix it. Okay. The other thing is, uh, and many people have alluded to this, but I have to tell you this is so prevalent in city council meetings. They believe their reports are sacrosanct. When a staff person writes a report, that's all they know. There's a sideline of boards and commissions that are doing the eyes and ears work of council. And we're looking at those same reports, we're going, no, that's not what that means. 
they're presenting it this way, but they're not. A perfect example was a few years ago, the entire board of commission voted to um, not raise utility rates on their customers. Mm -hmm. What got sent to council was a report in writing that said, um, I don't agree with this. This was the chair of that committee. And he presented it as the committee made the recommendation to raise rates. When everybody who saw the minutes knows that the report didn't match the minutes and didn't match what the person said in front of council. And there was no connect for that. And when people raised that, it was too late because council had already made the decision to raise rates. It's difficult, I know, but if they could just go in with a bit of skepticism, just because our charming mayor says something doesn't mean it's the fact. Just because a group of people go to city council meetings and talk about it. It's not, it, the facts are often different than what we're being told. Um, I, I, what I don't want is for the school to become a PR arm of city council. But everything that it was said about the school and how things are handled, moving public comment to certain times, not allowing people to speak, putting this arbitrary five minute rule when someone is up there and speaking with passion about something and then say, oh, time's up, you have to sit down. I don't understand. That's, that's not at all um, governance. It's not governance, it's performance. And we're tired of that. Thank you. Thank you. You're muted, Tracy. Sterling, if you're uncomfortable talking about Columbia Public Schools, I, I think that you definitely have something to add about um, your interactions with um, the police department, with um, Chief Jones, with Mike Kester, and um, you're strategizing with the young people to help them, um, you know, help their voices be heard and helping them understand public policy. Where did he go? Did we lose him? No, no, you you cut me, you cut my video off a little while ago. So. I didn't cut your video off. Oh, I, I did it, I'm sorry. You. You're walking around and making me dizzy. I just thought you turn it back on. Did, did it block <laughs> you? Did it block you from turning it back on? Yeah. Oh, did I'm you sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to leave it. <laughs> did you see? It wasn't me, Sterling. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just, I just wanted to pause it while you were walking. And I thought you would just turn it back on when you were ready. <laughs> my, my bad. I did I did not mean to. Man, I'm messing up by the numbers. Sterling, no. I owe you an apology again. No problem. Um, <laughs> uh, no, you know, my comments in the... My comments are, are in the chat and they can remain in the chat as, <clears throat> as, as, uh, as they are. Um, I mean, this isn't really the place nor the forum, you know, to have that, you know, level or layer of discussion. I don't agree with everything. Uh, I don't 100% agree. Um, and I think that it does in some instances come from a standpoint of naivete. I have not been a parent of, a, of students in the Columbia School District, but for about two and a half, three years, you all's uh, interactions and inner workings of the, of the, I mean, of the, the, the twists and knaves and the snares and the bureaucracy, while they probably mirror in some effects in some ways across the board, from my experience um, in Kansas City, they're not, I don't have enough to skin in the game to, to sit here and, and debate back and forth about really interjecting my opinion on whether or not I agree with or believe the, the people who are in admin uh, just have this outright dastardly, what have you, um, uh, or imperialistic nature. I mean, what, what do they have to gain by being imperialistic over the kids in Columbia, Missouri? I, I, so I, I, like I said, before I even you know, go into that regard, um, I need to learn more. I need to be more experienced um, because I just don't, um, I don't think that I can provide anything uh, 
other than just being the person in the room that tells you, I don't, I don't believe that that's the case, or I need to see more evidence. Some of you all have seen enough evidence. You have lived through enough instances. So you have, um, you have your opinions and they're educated for what reason they are. So I, I can stand back and be supportive without being, um, you know, without being wholeheartedly in agreement uh, in regards to the district. In regards to the police department, however, oh, oh, hold on. I will say the reason I make the comment and make the bifurcation of bureaucracy and policy from the district versus bureaucracy and policy from the municipality um, is because I know that a significant amount of this layered pushback uh, from our end is about the perspective that is going to always battle against the school to prison pipeline. Uh, that's evident, it is real, it exists. Um, but I won't experience that in my home. Um, there will never be a lapse, um, a, a cataclysmic uh, chasm between the education and aptitude level of my, my children and whatever bar any state sets. Because as a parent, I make it my priority to not trust that what they're going to teach my kids in a school building is all that they're going to need to be equipped in this society. That's where the biggest pitfall of the school to prison pipeline comes from anyway. Parents just so happening to uh, wash their hands of thorough involvement in their kids' education, in their kids' behavior and development, in their kids' life and emotional learning. If you think that you could just send them to that school building and expect that the teachers in that building are going to teach them and the admin in that building are going to teach them how to behave and this and that, and you could just come home and cook dinner or make McDonald's and watch TV with them and play Xbox and everything's good, get them to practice and that's cool. That's on you as a parent. So, I, man, y'all, I said, I even talked my way into making that statement, even though I said I wasn't going to. Um, so, Shirley, uh, one of the things that we were interested in is what is it that we need our reporters to know and yeah. our newspapers to know so that our community is better informed? We well, weren't. We don't need you to agree with what we've seen and well, what we've experienced. Know, That's not important. I just care. Well, it is important to me if I do agree with people that I care about. I care about. But you don't. Well. You don't have to agree with us. We don't. All of us don't agree all the time. Oh, I know. I know. So, first, first and foremost, when you're, you're, uh, I think any reporter um, needs to ask more than one or two people, one or two point person. They need to ask more than just the people who appear to be, you know, uh, running the show or running the event. Um, I've seen in some of my experience in dealing with, uh, in particular, Missourian reporters, uh, as soon as they've gotten a couple of people to answer the questions that they want to get answered, they're good. Um, in particular, don't utilize the, the, and I'm saying this from my perspective, don't just take what I said and make that your story. Uh, I might, I might think of, uh, the president of the people's defense is in, don't take what I said, clip out, you know, this is the, the, the nuts and bolts of journalism. You're going to hear a statement. You're going to clip the things out of it that, you know, lead you down the path of your story, and then you'll report it. But in the, in the instance of that snapshot of that conversation being clipped and parsed down, the essence of it is left. Um, I know a couple of folks who were in the organization that I've been affiliated with who have said to, you know, particular Missourian reporters, either I'm not going to speak with you or I'm going to require to see what you have said I said. Actually, the case, that's a dearth of trust um, that really the community is going to either look to you for being a voice and vehicle or they're not going to pay attention. And so, you know, when, when you have such a 
vivacious social media culture um, where uh, where are we going to find the time and the, the happy medium for where social media at least interactions personal interactions on social media can become a point of source point uh, for reporters I'm not trying to say I understand the, the ins and outs of the industry uh, extremely well. But I mean, my goodness, uh, a lot of people get all their news from those threads uh, as, as truthful, as factual as they may or may not be. Um, so we got to, at some point, start to fight the battle, I guess, on the same battleground as the people who are fighting against the, the message, you know, that right, fair, honest, truthful message. Because a lot of the folks who are sitting up on those dioceses are getting a significant amount of faulty news from sources that can be infiltrated by truth. They just aren't. So, I mean, um, and I saw your comment, Brittany. Yeah, some of that's on us about having a having to say the right thing or say what you mean, mean what you say, um, as far as uh, in dealing with the uh, news reporters. But I guess it, at a certain instance, when is it going to be incumbent upon the media in this town to hold people like Chief Jones and Lieutenant Hester's feet to the fire? We can ask him. I can ask uh, Chief Jones all day. Uh, is it part of you all's training to say to a, a person who you're stopping in the vehicle, either get out of the car or I'm going to pull you out? I can ask him that until I'm blue in the face. I'm going to get, why do I have this damn thing on? Um, I can ask him that until I'm blue in the face. I can ask him that ad nauseum. I can ask him that in the iron fist and the velvet glove way. Hey, excuse me, Chief Jones. When you all are in your train, I can ask him in a real agitated, angry black man way. And I know y'all don't just, is that how y'all do it? The difference is if one of your reporters is asking him and then each time they see him, they ask him until they get an answer. Be dogged. You know, they have this whole instance where these white kids was running around from the police, running, chasing, they were fighting in the street. There was hundreds of white kids up on the balcony, hollering and cheering. The boy was handcuffed, running from the police. They were applauding him. You know, they haven't told the public anything. And as an African-American male with children, it is extremely important for me to know that in the city of Columbia, if my kids can get away with that shit and still have their lives, I need to know. Because I am very much other experienced to know that you have a handcuffed black man running from the police, you're getting shot. So... The, the, this, the perception versus the reality of situations like that here in this town that can truly just be uh, explained away by not explaining anything, that's, you know, I think that's where the rubber meets the road as far as whether or not, um, you know, media in this town. Um, I mean, good Lord. Yeah, no, Iman, you, you just asked a great question about that too. I got an answer for you too. But publicly, there does need to be statements made uh, about the two people who hit folks. They ran into these girls. June 2nd, ran into them, ran them over. So, I mean, it's, there's just, there is just so, there's just so much that can be done, um, you know, standing, standing on the, you know, the, standing on the precipice of, of a, a cliff one can make the decision whether or not to jump or to back up. But if they don't have all the information that, hey, if you jump, there's this uh, parachute's going to pop out of the backpack on your back. Or if you back up, you're going to step into uh, some rushing rapids and get swept down. People don't have all the information. They can't make an informed or, or if nothing else, a reasonable decision for their circumstances. And I think in Columbia right now, more than anything else, there are too many people who get to hide, get to play the three card Molly in public with their position. You know, I, I think, I think a lot of the problem that people have with the Peter Stevens of the world is that 
and let them get away. Let them get away with it too long. Like, if this is truly what it is, Mike Kester is sitting up here as the community police uh, lieutenant, but here it is in 2018, we voted for community police and they had it all funded, then they took it away, but then they plugged him into that spot. Now, he doesn't get answered, doesn't have to answer any questions publicly. He sat in a damn stakeholder meeting. I was in three of them, and that son of a didn't speak um, uh, two handfuls of words. How are we going to have any kind of back and forth like two-way interaction with the community or rather stakeholders and then the police when the police sit in there like an empty suit. I mean, I'd have been better off talking to a, a warm glass of milk. Okay. And so people need to know that. The Pat Fowlers of the world, the city council person, she came and she asked every person, but, but there's no one who's in the media apparatus that is absolutely you can be you can embarrass people by making it extraordinarily apparent to everyone who's reading and listening that the person over here who this is about isn't speaking but that's i mean that's where that's where i see the gap in the chasm is you know the brian treases of the world being asked the hardest of the hardest questions why is why is the person you're negotiating with a racist and it's okay with you why is that person being able to dictate the movement of people who have to fulfill an import city policy, yet it is okay with you. Um, you negotiate, they negotiate that agreement with the uh, uh, CPOA on behalf of the taxpayers of the city of Columbia, not on behalf of the, the people of the bureaucracy of the shiny shoes sitting up there that are going to sign the other side of the deal, yet they are asking those questions. So he can give space to the POS all he wants. Notice I said POS in mind. <laughs> Um, because that's really what he's given space to. His own, his own ability. To well, make, I'm, I'm, honestly, to be a, a little small dictator in this little small space of City Hall, and it's an echo chamber. Well, so I mean, now you're gonna get, now you're gonna get worked up after you didn't have nothing to say. No, I didn't say I didn't have anything to say. I just said I didn't want to talk about the other part. Dwayne yeah. Case. Oh, by the way, y'all, please abstain, abstain, abstain. I've, uh, Brittany, two of your people from Missouri Faith Voices called yesterday, so they on the move uh, from the state, uh, uh, from the state body. Uh, abstain, abstain, abstain. That's that's all I got for you, Miss Bailey. I'm so sorry. I really didn't even introduce myself. I'm Sterling Brown. Nice <laughs> to meet you. <laughs> At work, girl. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait wait a minute. So. We need to let uh, uh, just our correlation uh, really quick before we go to Kendra, and that is something that Laura Wakefield has brought up, and that is the issue of hypocrisy. So the school board talks about safety, and we're going to do this, but it's okay for kids to get arrested. It's okay for kids to be locked up in boxes. It's okay, little kids for okay for little kids to get uh, broken hands. It's okay to manhandle kids with disabilities who are autistic. I mean, they're okay with that, right? And then at the same time, make these other decisions that are ostensibly about safety. Same thing with the police, right? There's a lot of hypocr hypocrisy um, coming from the mayor and the police chief and all that. Again, around public safety, um, safety for them, but not for us. Um, so anyway, um, Kendra, are you there? I know you've been having a heck of a time with your internet connection, but I thought you might talk about, when well, you and I talk about this a lot, about mm -hmm. outreach to the black community and trying to- Tracy, you're breaking up. Been yeah. Decimated over, over. Tracy, you've been, you're breaking up really bad. I just couldn't hear what you said. Yeah, I'm having a lot of technical difficulties. It's kind of taking me in and out. Um, uh, so um, I don't know if you guys Shirley, can. I'm gonna. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Kendra, I just wanted, I just wanted you to talk about outreach to the Black community and the fact that our Black community has been, I think, demoralized and broken many times by broken promises and and bad actors. Yeah, um, I can speak to um, the fact that I believe that um, we have a problem with uh, communicating with the black community directly. So I feel like there are, there's not enough people actually going and actually meeting up and speaking to people 
directly, uh, meaning going to homes, uh, contacting people over the phone if there's issues like follow up. Um, if there are issues that um, that uh, black folk in the community need to uh, have addressed, um, it may be just a, a media moment, like for the moment, and then it kind of dies down and nothing's done. Um, so we kind of we really need to have uh, people out there following up and making sure that things happen to build the trust. Um, I think that people in the community feel like um, um, there's there's their voices aren't heard because if uh, we're out here and we're arguing certain things uh, that's going on, it's not always something that directly is affecting them. And I I think that. If we have more people out there talking directly to people, I think we'll hit more on what the actual issues are. I think that when the the two girls got hit and we actually went and talked and directly heard um, this young lady personally, we had a different effect on how that played out. And then the mother actually. Yeah. Yeah, your audio is gone, Kendra. Kendra just left us. Can anybody hear? Is every did everybody blank out? No. Um. Yeah. She's oh. she dropped off. Okay. Sorry, Chad. Hello. We hear you now. Okay. Am I back? Yes, I you're back. Okay. Keep taking me off of there. I'm sorry. Um. And so I just feel like I think that there's things that we um from our our view of things we are out here arguing those. But if we don't actually go and meet with people and really hear the, the, the issues, because people really, I think the trust, they only tell us so much, or there's only so much going on. Um, but they want us to know in order for us to fix those things and we fight those things that really are happening in our community, we really have to build a trust so they open up and give us all the details. So I just keep, I come to that again, because we did see that the girl was hit and there was a problem and the media didn't actually go and talk to her. But when we went and actually talked to her, we got her emotions and her feelings. And you got, and actually, I think that you actually came to visit them at the house. So you got a whole different perspective. Of it. You can actually feed that back out to the community. And so I feel like the, a lot of the times we are fighting, but we're not fighting the underlying issues because we don't have to go directly meet up with them. Um, so I think we really need a team to do that and everybody's not welcome in everybody's home that's why we don't always get home details right. and so that's why i feel like we need to somehow bridge that gap because uh i mean, get all, I mean even with the, uh, the school district and all the things that are going on with that too um, even me as a grandparent with cps and the Kendra, Kendra, Chad, will you type to Kendra to type to type up her things and to email them to Ruby? Ruby, I think um, Kendra and I were really moved by the whole thing that happened with Beyonce. Mm -hmm. We also, that meeting that we had last week with the city with the consultants, that's really damaging. All those black people came together and they're like, what, and what are we doing? We're doing this again. And, and also the media doesn't know that any of this is happening because the city doesn't do it publicly. Right. right. So how do they cover it? You know, how do you, how do you cover it? And it's a mess. Right. And, uh, uh, uh as, as her audio cut out, I'm never going to try to speak to Grace. Again, people walk certain. away and they're like, well, we can't trust any of these people. Yeah, I'm sorry. I went out again. I'll try to do type up something too. But I just want to really, really, um, to, I want to really make it known that when, you, when we actually went and talked to the to Beyonce, just the emotion and that she was so upset that they talked to the white girl and not her. Yeah. And then she got to the point where she just didn't even want to communicate anymore. I mean, I think that just right. the surface of the communication with uh, the media was just, it was just the surface. We had right. to actually go out and physically make that contact to get the real story. And so I feel like that's where a lot of the problem with our black community, I mean, not just on that incident, but a lot of the incidents, 
Like when people are out here and they're being shot, do we really even really get the real true facts from the parents, the family members about, you know, how they are actually feeling? But what is actually sent out to in the media and out to the public is just surface stuff. And so I, I think we really need to work on that. I don't know exactly how we're going to work on that, but I think that we really need to get a group or uh, some folks that are willing to actually go and do that hard label because that's what that would be, um, getting in, getting back in and getting comfortable with our community. Shirley? Um, you know, my first question, and I won't even say it's my first question, uh, Ms. Kendra, as you're speaking, my brain just starts ringing out call paper, the call paper. And so my first question is, has Columbia ever had a black newspaper or a, a newspaper or a news publication that was uh, owned or run by uh, predominantly people of color? In the early 1900s. Oh, you're cutting out. That was last time. I, I, I wish I heard it went, you. you said, it went through 1926, but a lot of those issues are, the, Tracy, There was a black owned newspaper run by a black man. Tracy, can you mute your computer audio and just call in and use the audio from your phone? Because we can't hear you. Sterling, she oh. said that in the early 1900s, there was a, a, a black paper. Uh, it was run by an African-American man and that it ended in about 1926. Okay. I, I only, the reason I asked that was because as we sit here uh, grappling with how do we uh, engage or how do we re-engage the African-American community here in Columbia, I just kind of think back to some of the, the hallmarks of news gathering uh, from my youth. And I, like I said, I grew up in Kansas City. It's not Columbia. But I know that um, three generations of my family primarily got their news from the call paper, which is a Black-owned, I mean, it's a historically known Black-owned newspaper. And so maybe, maybe part of the engagement process is uh, the, here in the African American we have was some type of reputable I think what the real turns into, and this kind of folds back into what you were saying a minute ago, Brittany, comes back from us, who people come before us as a color or a long who we live up to that community as a place where they should get their news. And so I kind of look at it and just make sure I speak Ruby Bailey correctly, that if that's where the trust in, or if that's what the trust is in town, it even comes to the point of the community of the uh, group uh, when they're doing their work and they're right, um, and pushing that out to the community is, hey, if there's somebody who you can listen to and trust, if there's a voice in the news media you can listen to and trust, it's this, I mean, I don't know. I'm just, my brain tells me that there's a, so many different ways to skin a cat that maybe, maybe we just need to kind of look at a couple of those other ways to help build that engagement. Because uh, Ms. Kendra, you, I think you hit the nail on the head about 40 times. And that's that's where I want to get my mobile work done. So we can definitely uh, organize some more of that offline. Yes, I agree. I also, I mean, it really, it saddens me that when I am, actually, when I see the newspaper and I look at my social media feed, or if I, I get on my daughter's or my son's, you know, media feed, they have more accurate news than the newspaper on issues or things that are going on. And there a couple of weeks ago, there was a home shot up and, uh, and it's been being shot up over, you know, several times and, 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 they're, and they're in the news. And I seen that a news person was trying to video uh, what was going on and then What she saying? Awesome. What is she yeah, kind of going off of this conversation, I guess it goes back to my um, 
idea that it goes both ways and some of this is on us and like the media has to maintain some sort of unbiasedness so there are some things that won't be on their radar for this sake of it can't be on their radar and i think that goes back to us about how are we organizing ourselves so that way we are creating moments that are undeniable for people to come if I know of an issue that's going on in the city and I know there needs to be eyes on it, what am I doing to create the strongest environment possible for that event um, or that issue to have eyes on it? And once I know that there's going to be eyes on it, what am I doing once people are in the room that feels so powerful that, goddamn, if I don't report on this, everybody here is going to know because this is how vital this moment is. And so I think that it's a lot deeper than just asking people to show up and cover a thing or ask people to show up and talk to a few folks about what happened at an event, but like, what is the space that we're creating to provide and make room for the stories that we want to see? It's not solely on the media to create that environment. If anything, they're stepping into that environment once it's created. Um, and so that feels like something that needs to be named here. We can give them all the heads up in the world, but if they show up to something and nothing's going down, they're not gonna come back and cover it owners not going to be seen um, as something worthy of of reporting and something that has value even if we feel the opposite and so i think that there's some accountability on organizations to think about and be intentional about the spaces that we're inviting people in to may uh, i i'm sorry may I make a comment on that can uh, i'm sorry Brittany. may i make a comment on what you just said yeah um there is a seismic shift right now that is taking place in journalism finally <laughs> Um, after decades of simple conversation and lip service about um, this, this quote unquote need for objectivity, which never existed ever in any fashion. Um, but also our responsibility as, a, as media outlets and as the fourth estate and as watchdogs and as um, whether we as advocates to be those things so I appreciate greatly your willingness and your question about you know whether um, and how to build a space. Um, and I do appreciate that, but it is incumbent on anybody who says they want to do this thing to do this thing. So when Tracy called me about um, Ms. Will Beyonce Williams and said, Ruby, here's the deal. My, I, and by the way, I put my cell phone number and my email address in, um, in the chat, use it. When she called me and said, look, this is what's going on. You may not know. Um, then at that point, she puts the ball in my court. It's incumbent on me to get to my people and say, okay, so did you see? Well, why didn't you? Okay, well, this is how we're going to try to rectify this now, right? And it, it requires not only me to send somebody, um, but it requires me to show up, right, with them. Uh, and, and, that's, and, and in that instance, showed me a lot and actually it was the impetus for me starting the class that i started because i had no clue what they did not know until i saw for myself the interview heard beyonce speak saw the interaction and then got the story that he wrote and said oh okay yeah he, this is insufficient and it wasn't insufficient because he was negligent it wasn't insufficient because he didn't care it wasn't insufficient because um, uh, he just he just kind of he couldn't do, he did not have that thing he had no context he had no life experience it wasn't just that he was not black it was that he was he, he had not lived and he didn't understand when someone said why doesn't anybody ever hear me what that means right um, and so that is why I, you know, I really started that course that Tracy's talking about, and I'm not going to keep talking because I want to hear y'all talking. Y'all can hear me talk any other time. Um, but I so appreciate what you're saying, and I, and I, you know, and I get it, and I'm not saying don't, you know, don't think that way. Um, but I am saying there's at least one person in the room who, me, who recognizes our um, moral obligation to get this right. Um, and that you all don't have to um, not, um, create, it's, we ask for permission to come into your space what, with that asking and that responsibility, we come in and it's our job to find the story, unless you had it and even then, right? But it's, our, it's on us 
to train these kids um, and to send them out there to be real reporters. That's on us. Um, and if we don't, we fail them and we fail you. And, and Tracy and I have had conversations about what the Missouri method is and can be. And as beautiful as it can be, it can also be extraordinarily traumatic to, to marginalized groups of people. And that's, that's, not what, that's not what I'm gonna stand around and watch. I think you speak into some of my point though, which is that because Tracy and folks in the community were there to speak to that issue, yes. there was someone that could put a system of accountability in place to say, hey, what y'all doing here ain't what the real story is. So get your shit together and yes. do something that, that gives dignity and honor to the people that you name it in the story. Well, yeah, and I think that sometimes we get so upset at what was reported on that we don't do that accountability piece, okay, which okay. is what I mean by inviting people into the space. You know, okay. give them the game. Folks don't know what they don't know. Yes. Well, it, Tracy, he was willing to do something. I mean, luckily I had a relationship with her, but she did something more than that. She came to the house. She came to this child's house. She spoke to the mother. Kendra and I made a personal home visit, you know, something that Kendra and I think is really important in our outreach work is going to people's homes, going to where they're at, getting to know people and being their advocates. And it's really hard. And, and we, when we saw that situation, we were like, wow, this is really messed up. And also, you know, the police don't talk, right? Um, you know, people were calling and giving us information, but that wasn't, that wasn't going to fix the problem that this girl would have been completely erased completely erased and i'm really happy because i think for the for the student who showed up he learned something about humanity that day and if, if anything comes out of that that kid walked away with oh my god i would have erased young humanity because i was afraid and i didn't know how to get in that space with her um and that's that's a really you don't teach that. It has to be modeled to you if you didn't come with it. Some of us come with it because of our lived experiences. But for these kids who are really privileged, they don't, you know, they could see someone get run over by a car and they're like, that happens to black people. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's kind of rough, but not that far, honestly, not that far. So, um, and I'm glad she did the class because she took that accountability thing like, wait a minute, maybe the way we're teaching these kids in Mizzou, this shit ain't working, right? So this is the first time I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. I know that that pressure is going on in other departments on campus. I know it's a journey, not a race. Um, but I'm glad that I know her. I'm glad I could pick up the phone because if it could have been somebody else before Ruby got here, because I had those arguments before, a lot of them, and got nowhere. So I'm a black managing executive director at, uh, um, at the paper. All right, any last comments for Ruby? I think we've chopped her ear off. Chad, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to throw a few things in there and it's nothing terribly uh, unique that hasn't been discussed, but just to kind of drill down to some of those most important things. Like I, I've been very critical of the journalism in this town. Um, and you know, I can, I can at least give a pass to students to some extent. It's when you look at every venue that we have is just doing a real shoddy job of really doing substantive reporting or um, any sense of holding somebody accountable. And that's, that, that's kind of the key. We have so many elected officials that don't otherwise have a, a method for us to go to and challenge um, without public opinion. I mean, that's really the only area we have. Like, for example, Sheriff Kerry, we, we can't go to really anybody and complain about him and have him censured or look into holding him accountable for anything. And so if we don't have like, you know, um, kind of a strong um, outlet for journalists to, you know, track what the issues are, there's no way to hold them accountable. And they like that. Um, <laughs> I'm sure they love it. Uh, I, I want to throw out a, a, a term here, sophistry. Sophistry is what is practiced by Steepleman, by the mayor, by everybody in a position of power. And the point is sophistry basically establishes might by persuasion. So the validity of your argument, the facts, the logic, all those kind of things. I mean, and you look back at classical Greek, you know, the, the schools of thought, there was the one that was kind of like, you know, the, uh, the scientifically um, educated or logically established, 
you know, you, you, you can look at something and then kind of base it on its own merit. Then you have those who are like, well, if I can convince people that they like this better than this, then that's power. That's, that's, that's the truth we're after. And I mean, certainly in our culture, um, it, it plays out and you see it through and through. And so um, I, I think we have a lot of sophists in, in positions. But the, um, the big thing I would like to see out of the, the papers, we have persistent chronic problems. Um, and, you know, Sterling brought up, you know, the, the school to prison pipeline. We absolutely have that. And we have bad actors at every level. And I mean, this is not just to go out there and call out the leadership uh, as the first line of defense. Uh, we engaged with CPS for probably a good six or eight months trying to get to the bottom, working with this interviewing before it got publicly um, combative, really. And it, it got to that point because we realized this is stopping at the same uh, universal denominator. It's the same individual, that same choke point to power. And you look and after enough of exposure of seeing that repeated behavior and no changes of behavior when you ask and inquire and then call them out on it, um, you, you, know, you realize that it's not a part of the you know, bigger policy. You can't just like wash it off as institutional. There are leadership decisions that drive these. And there's no way we're going to ever hold these people accountable if we don't have chronicled all these articles. And so I would, I would encourage the, the, the papers look at like maybe the school to pipeline prison model mm -hmm. and focus on that as a huge chunk of your reporting and like segment up and assign reporters to where they become specialists in that and they can actually generate papers so that number one, your average citizen can go up there and like search through your um, archives and find information that's uh, well researched, but also that your new reporters coming on have an existing body of knowledge that you've already generated. Um, I, I think that would, uh, that, that would just help, I think, in so many ways, because once you start digging just a little bit, you're not going to ever be at a loss for a story in this town. There are so many problems and so many angles and so many different personalities that it's just, you know, once you start scratching the surface, they're going to learn and they're going to learn some horrific lessons. And I want to, I want to actually encourage that, that if the paper can really kind of look at the uh, community problems that we're facing that we can address, um, you are pretty much the strongest influencer because you have the largest reach. You have the ability to inform and yet also like, you know, persuasion by itself is not bad, but I'm saying if you focus too much on just lying to get your point across to persuade people, that, that obviously gets toxic. But well, Ruby, I think that's true also for the sheriff's department. We get zero accountability from the sheriff. We just got this uh, data from the police department, which I, it's, it's maddening, but it's how many children have been arrested in the past 10 years by the police. Now, this guy got this data and they won't break it down by school and all that, but this the bare numbers of the number of kids have been arrested, white, black, um, indigenous. It's disgusting. It's just disgusting. The police should be able to, I'm probably losing these guys. The police should, should be providing that information quarterly. Um, they need to just, you know, explain why, what's going on. And we haven't been able to get them to, that, to share that information. Same thing with the vehicle stop data. It should not be a secret who they're working with on campus, right? It should not be a secret how they're gonna look at the data. And if he has a temporary ordinance about pretext stops, y'all need to check him every 30 days to see what the outcomes are. Mm -hmm. Not when he feels like telling you. Because right now it's like, it's on an honor system. Whenever somebody feels like asking him and they'll say, well, we'll get around to it. So um, I, I think that's problematic. Same with the mayor. There's no interview with the mayor to get any meaningful information out of him about how these decisions are made or why. Zero. The, um, consultants for you know police values it's never been before the council right city manager can use his contract authority and do whatever he wants we need to check the city manager what is your contract authority why did you do this behind the public's back why are you doing it this way how do you know the people that you hired are are qualified i mean these are like you know these are like nuts and bolts questions right why are you doing things without an rfp you got a hundred year problem, 200 year problem. Why are you hiring, you know, quacks and Twinkies, you know? So, um, I don't, Lynn likes it when I say quacks and Twinkies. <laughs> but anyway, I think that we're 
Done. How are you guys doing? Anybody have something else to add? I was just going to add something really Only quickly. One. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Um, so something that was brought to my mind is just, you know, we all have kind of our list of demands um, that we present from time to time uh, to city council or to the school board or all of these institutions. One of the things that I feel like falls between the cracks is the request for our data. Um, and if there was a way that even when we don't have a school board meeting that we are up at the mic saying again, can you please release data about black kids who are restrained? Can you please release that? I mean, we've asked for that for two years now, um, just for releasing of data. I feel like, you know, it could be incumbent on the media to continue asking for those facts. Um, these are truths that are out there. They're just not being given to us and it's not powerful enough for us to be asking clearly clearly it's not we don't have the power to um, get that information re revealed which should be public um, parents should have access to that there's no way for us to keep people accountable if we can't see the data of what's happening and i mean that's just for me that's basic stuff right those are numbers that we should all have access to and that the media should have access to so i don't know if there's a way to uh, uh, I don't know, keep up with all of those data requests that have been made um, and just let it be known that still there's no answer. Still there's no answer. We have a similar situation. The sunshine laws here are, are I've not worked in a place where they are this ineffective. I have not. And then um, our ability or willingness to um, retain counsel go after that stuff um, is, is limited. But yes, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I would just like to say it happens across the board. It is everywhere. It, information is not there. And often, um, at least in the, I've been here 15 years, and in the past 15 years, it's gotten more rigorous because of groups like this that we're all connected on some level and we're all saying to each other did you get this have you heard about that can you stand up with me and um uh report on this or give a testimony on this um it's it's extraordinarily shocking to me as because i was the foia officer in the state of virginia it was extraordinarily shocking to me to be able to act a very direct question where is the report on the city's investments? And it's been months. How do you not have this? How are you investing millions of dollars and you can't get a report out? They tell us that the software doesn't work. But we're not buying that. We, you know, we see that it's a lie. It's so obvious it's a lie. How are the reporters supposed to know this? And I think that's the difficulty we're struggling with. We might give you a lot of information. What we're hoping, or what I'm hoping, is that our young journalists, our training journalists, and even the kids in the classroom, because those kids, have, they're, they're doing great jobs for their yearly projects, is to keep asking the same question. Every single time, the road should be not only, how do I spell your last name, but where is the report? There have to be reports. They issue reports. So it feels like just teach them to ask that one question every time because it's not coming out there. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions uh, before we close? I'm trying to uh, um, Post, post something, but I'm going to clo clo close with the preamble to the Brown Act. Hope everyone can hear me. The people of the state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. Um, it states the preamble to the Brown Act. The people in delegating their authority do not give their public servants the right to decide what is good for the people to know and what is not good for them to know. Boom. We don't have that here. <laughs> but in, in California, they will run you down if you don't do you don't do a sunshine law. So anyway, Virginia, same in Virginia. Yeah. We trust a lot of people, but it's that's the way it is. That's what governance is. Thank you, Ruby. Appreciate your time and. Um,